Hi, I'm Anna. I'm from Australia, and I'm starting a company. I wanted to learn from the best, so I flew to the USA to meet with successful entrepreneurs and learn from their stories. We don't sleep when the sun goes down. We don't waste no precious time. All my friends in the room. Making up for teenage crime. just really hear your story. It's mm -hmm. such an incredible journey and so many women would love to hear it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I grew up in the Midwest in the United States. I grew up in Wisconsin. But I always had big dreams. I was always looking for ways to make money when I was a kid. Were you? Yes, I would do anything to make money. Sell Christmas cards, compete in competitions. <laughs> <I would do. laughs> so I, I think really the fact that uh, I actually became an entrepreneur is not to, so surprising. I was very fortunate when I was in college. I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and between my junior and senior year, I actually said, I gotta see the rest of the world, just not be here working away all, the whole time. And, and I wound up going uh, to Europe, but I stopped uh, in England. And I saw this poster for a lecture on geosynchronous orbiting satellites. And I thought, wow, that's cool. And I what 20-year-old woman would say, oh, that's like for me, I've got to go in there. <laughs> but that was me. I thought satellites, outer space. I just kept thinking about it. I came out of that lecture, I said, wow. And it was in the late 60s. It was the time of the Cold War. It was when we had the Berlin Wall, and we have the Great Wall of China to keep people out. And we didn't know that much about what was behind those walls. And I thought, wow, we could get behind those walls. We could really communicate with people. I wonder if they're just like us, really, or not. So I went on to write a master's thesis on satellite communications and its potential impact on governments, on people, on communications. That powerful idea that really led me into work in the satellite business, work in the cable business, work in television, and then put all those things together to create the first basic cable network delivered by a satellite across the country. Yeah, I have to say it was really exciting times. It was just uh, it was like the Wild West. Groundbreaking. Yeah. So you were really able to use technology and with the power of storytelling to create something new and really almost start an industry. It's always fun to be there at the right time. Timing is so important. When I had this idea, it, the market wasn't ready for it. Really? Because, yes, because here in the United States and really around the globe, communication satellites were, were used by governments. So there was a very specific event that changed it here in the United States. It was September 30th, 1975, and the industry brought the most famous boxing match of all time on a live broadcast and brought that around the globe live to Vero Beach, Florida and demonstrated for our congressmen and senators that were there that satellites could be used for a good commercial purpose and one that people would enjoy and it's really what changed the ability for the industry to access satellites for commercial purposes. And once you had the idea for the company and you knew once you saw that boxing event you're like I know I can make this happen people are going to understand the vision behind it. How did you start the company? The gentleman that I had worked for in the cable industry for a couple of years uh, was Robert Rosencrantz. Bob knew what my dream was and his cable systems that he owned were going to be beneficiaries of getting new subscribers with new programming. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bob actually said to me that night, Kate, tonight your dream comes true. I just thought, okay, we're on our way. Their company uh, put up the first $600,000 to start uh, the business. And you know, it was just license fee from the cable operators that really created the first cash flow. So uh, it was really very stable from the very beginning and grew to a multi-billion dollar business over the 20 some years that I ran the company. Today people would say that it was using a disruptive technology to change a business. That's how people would 
look at it today. And now we're being disrupted again by the internet and being able to distribute programming uh, via broadband and on a global basis instantaneously. So all the models are being threatened now and changed, and that's just how it goes. I mean, technology does disrupt businesses, there's no question about it. I think even as a society, we're being disrupted uh, by the plethora of communications that people can, you know, utilize. But importantly, I think it is also bringing another two to three billion people into the conversation who never before were connected. the highlights being a part of that company and founding it from the beginning? You know, to tell you the truth, when people ask me that question, I, I, I always say it's the people. It's the vision that you're all trying to execute. And again, there we were out in the Wild West creating something pr brand new that people didn't know. They didn't know they wanted to pay for it. They didn't know they <laughs> wanted it. The challenge really was to start off and carve out. We had to carve out a place for ourselves in a landscape that had been divided among others. And it's always hard to disrupt other people's set patterns that are controlling the marketplace. So not only did we break into the sports business, which you know was all just on television before that television broadcast, we were the first to license really popular series from television for our cable network. We were the first to create big series of movies when we launched our movie series. We did it with 24 original movies a year. We had to create some original programming because licensing some of the most popular series were too expensive for us or the contracts were too long. Murder, She Wrote was one of the early series that we really, and Miami Vice. Well, those are kind of, we had a series before that, but those were the two that really kind of broke open the dam. I, I really never thought very much about being a woman. I tried to help other women. I was, you know, one of the founders of Women in Cable, which is now Women in Cable and Telecommunications. One of the founders of the Cable Advertising Bureau to bring more advertising into the industry. I, I was really there at the forefront of almost all of those different kinds of organizations. And I was always insistent that, for example, for Women in Cable, I was insistent from the very beginning that we train management because back in those mm -hmm. days, women basically were you know, answering phones, doing secretarial work, or doing customer service work, but really weren't getting any training at all on how to grow up in management, how to manage other people, to get sort of generalist skills. And I said, look, if women are gonna succeed in this business, we need to give them a broader perspective on how the business is run so that they can grow up in the management teams and be a part of really the decision making in the industry. So I guess the competitive nature in me, I love competing with the boys. They were mostly the boys <laughs> out there. And I, I just I just felt this is great, I can do this. And I realized I had one advantage. You know, people knew who I was because I was different than everybody else, you know, so that to some degree was an advantage. Hearing about the past and how there wasn't systems in place to support females to go into management, have you seen it come a long way and is there still a long way to go? Yes, I think we, we have come a long way. We're a long way from where we were when I started. Right today, women's businesses are underfunded by 30 to 50 percent and yet they overperform the marketplace by 12 percent. I say, if they had parity capital, what would they do? When it comes to finance, which is something that I work in today and, and capital formation for women-led businesses, we're still not on parity. And I would say, going back in the days when we were starting up and then Ted Turner was st starting up his business, the industry backed Ted in ways that were productive for him. I mean, Ted would have gone bankrupt several times if he hadn't gotten the kind of financial support that he did from the industry to really put him over the rough spots when he was running out of capital. And when he started CNN, it took a lot of capital to start CNN. I loved surpassing TBS in the ratings and I never look back and Ted could never catch you, say, and I love that. <laughs>
there. So I, I mean, yes, it did, but we're we're actually very friendly and have a lot of respect for one another. And that's one of the reasons I really have been working for the last 15 years to achieve parity in financing for women-led businesses through the venture capital market. My dad used to tell me, you know, he said, you make your own luck. It's when you get the opportunity at the right time and you're prepared to take advantage of it. And that's what I did. I worked for seven years in different businesses between 68 and 75 to really be in the right place at the right time. You just really have to work at it. It just doesn't magically happen as some people like to think it does. And people don't realize, you know, all the setbacks that you re along the way and how persistent you have to be. Sometimes in the darkest days, you have to have faith in yourself and the people you're with. It's realistic and I think it inspires other women to know, you know, you are going to face obstacles and it's a part of the journey. And you're not the only one that faces them. You know, there, everybody out there that has achieved this great success has had to do it over, you know, a lot of setbacks, a lot of iteration, a lot of pivoting, a lot of, you know, assessing the market, reassessing what you're doing. There's just a lot that goes into it. When President Clinton uh, asked me to take a presidential appointment to chair the National Women's Business Council, I said, yes, I, I could do that. But I said to him, this isn't the challenge I want to meet. I'm not reporting to Congress. I said, I, I want to get women into private equity. I want to get big financing behind women's businesses that are growth businesses. So he said, great. And so I used that platform really to what became Springboard Enterprises, a launch that we went to Silicon Valley. I went to Silicon Valley because that's where the money was and got some colleagues around the table with us. And we said, look, we would like to see if we can find some women run businesses that venture capital will back. And I'll, some people said, yeah, we'll help you. And some people said, you're crazy. They're not going to, women aren't up to it. They don't grow these kind of businesses. You know, they think we all bake cookies. Well, we all bake them and eat them, but that doesn't mean that that's our business, you know? <laughs> We we're hoping to get 100 applications, so maybe we could have 10 companies to, to uh, put through a training program and then present them to the venture capitalists. We got 350, and I, I knew right then that this was an underfunded marketplace. We selected 26 of those companies to present. The 26 women got up there, and I, I would venture to say that most people in the audience that came to look at what, what is this really all about, and what are these companies, who are these people, I bet they were really surprised to see the quality. It was a very exciting day, but the most exciting thing about it, 22 of those companies got funded. Two others merged their business. One woman sold her business and one wasn't funded out of that entire class. And we've never looked back ever since that time. The tech market collapsed 60 days later. We kept going. That year we went on to Northern Virginia, was sponsored by AOL. We went on to Harvard where we had a program in Boston that year. And ever since that time, in the last 15 years, we've screened almost 6,000 companies. We want to see that they have a vision, that they have the ability to execute, that they are trainable. We call it, they have to be coachable because they're going to have to learn and iterate very quickly. That's what you have to do to scale a company. 83% of them raise capital. 80% over 15 years are in business today. And the reason we had to create it was because there, weren't, there just wasn't a connection. In 99, there was $104 billion in venture capital invested in the United States. 1.7% went to women-led businesses. I said, somebody's got to do something about this. So I just, typical, just set out into the wilderness trying to find <laughs> I love that attitude. You hear this crazy stuff, and yeah. it's very, very sad to hear it, but you're like, Let's do something about it. Let's just make it happen. Let's, yeah, I'm a, I'm a results-oriented person. I just love your attitude and how you're like competitive nature. <laughs> it's so good though, because it's so real and honest, mm -hmm. you know, like, and you have to have that drive. And I think that's really valuable. For well, I mean, know. some, you know, some people may feel that my competitive drive is over <laughs> in overdrive, but <clears throat> I see nothing but an infinite possibilities when I look at the world. Yeah, you know. <laughs>
I'm doing more, but, uh, you know. Because my dad would also say to me, you grow too soon old and too late smart, you know.